take over and uh, give these regular people a break, I guess, kind of, except for they're all up here doing stuff. So uh, our guest piano player is uh, not going to be uh, doing our sermon today. We'll have uh, Mr. Jeff Carr doing that. Uh, you'll see some other men uh, up here helping out um, doing stuff. So thought I'd welcome here uh, with uh, a reading from Psalm 18 um, from David. It says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge. He's my shield and the thorn of my salvation. My stronghold. I call to the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day that you have made. And uh, thank you for uh, each and every person here uh, gathered in your name to celebrate you and, and, uh, and to worship you. And we just pray a special blessing on uh, each person that comes up and does special music, uh, or leads us in, in worship, uh, brings us a message, or shares a testimony. And uh, we just thank you once again for providing this uh, building for us to use to, to worship you and glorify your name. Uh, we thank you once again for your son, Jesus. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
Father, thank you for loving us so much. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. Father, we love you, and it's good to gather up with your people, to gather up with our family, our church family, our community of faith, where you have placed each one of us. Father, thank you for drawing each one of us here today, for speaking into our hearts as we worship you. Father, would you continue to speak to us now as we hear your word preached and your word read aloud. Father, I lift up Jeff to you, and I pray you would just settle his heart and set aside his personality and speak through him through the power, the supernatural power of your Holy Spirit residing within him and help us to receive what we need to receive so that we can leave here today knowing our next step because what it is that you have spoken into each individual heart. Thank you for the purpose that you have given each one of us in the kingdom. Father, we love you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus. All right, before Jeff preaches, we're going to have one more special music. Nick and Charlotte, come on up.
you don't want to touch them, you don't have to, but if you're like me, sometimes it's good to have something in your hands to, to mess with sometimes. All right. Uh, so while they're finishing up, I uh, heard a story that they actually read it the other day. And uh, I never heard it before, and I thought it was kind of, kind of fu funny, but also at the same time it kind of struck a chord with me. And uh, the story goes like this, is that there was a uh, young boy who had kept asking his parents for a new bicycle. And his parents just didn't have uh, the funds to get him a new bicycle. And, uh, and so the boy kept asking, and finally the, the father set him down and said, son, I said, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll do the best we can, but right now things are tight, um, and we're just asking God to provide for our needs. And so the little boy went away kind of disappointed. And as he sat in his room, he had an idea. He goes, well, I have a need. That need is a new bicycle. I think I'll, I think I'll pray to Jesus for a new bicycle. And so he's thinking about, well, how should I go about doing this? And he said, he said, well, maybe if I make a deal. He goes, maybe if I tell Jesus that I'll be good for an entire year, that he'll get me a new bicycle. And so he went, got down on his knees and he said, dear Jesus, and then he stopped and he went, no, Jesus isn't going to buy that. He's not going to believe that. So he goes, he said, so he thought again. He goes, well, maybe if I tell Jesus, I'll be good for three weeks. Maybe that, maybe that'll do it. So he got down on his knees again and started to pray. And then he stopped and goes, no, Jesus knows me better than that. He knows I'm not going to make it three weeks. And so he went back to the living room and sat there on the sofa trying to figure out how he could get a new bicycle. And he looked up on the mantle and he saw a statue of the Virgin Mary. And then he had an idea. He went and got the statue of the Virgin Mary, took it back to his room, and hid it back in his closet. And then he went back to the living room, got on his knees and said, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mom again, please get me a bicycle. <laughs> Anyway, I don't think it quite works that way, but oftentimes we uh, try to make deals with, with Jesus, with God. And oftentimes he already knows the, the deal we really need. So, well, Anyway, so what you have in front of you is a, a little bungee cord, and uh, the title of today's sermon is Bungee Cord Life Lessons. Okay, what you can learn from a bungee cord, all right? And uh, since this is Men's Sunday, I thought it was appropriate that I'm sh I'd be very surprised if most people in this room, not just men, haven't had any experiences with bungee cords. And just by a show of hands, has anybody ever tried to use a bungee cord and either it snapped or the other end came undone? That ever happened to anybody? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? And then we learn real quickly some lessons there. We're going to look at several passages of scripture as we go through some of these life lessons. And uh, some of them are up here, some of them are not. Uh, but first of all, a little quick history of, of the bungee cord. So uh, if you look at the history timeline, you see that uh, the first recorded, I guess, um, use of maybe a bungee cord or a stretchy cord or vine, uh, 500 AD. I don't know how they found this out, but men in the Republic of... Uh, Vanatui, I guess, started a tradition of testing their manhood by tying springy vines to their ankles and then jumping out of trees. It's the first known use of stretchy materials for fun, and during that also resulted in injuries. I just, I just wonder after the first guy did it, if the other guy was like, ooh, let me try, you know? I don't know. Uh, then in 1736, a Frenchman, Charles Moore, I won't say that last part there, uh, uses sap from the South American rainforest to produce natural rubber. It was all good until they found out later that it probably just kind of just dissolved, you know, degraded in sunlight. And that's when, you know, Goodyear came up with the vulcanized rubber, uh, which made it more stable, but we still know that sunlight does not not do good on rubber. 1845, uh, the rubber band is patented by Stephen Perry in England. Kind of blew my mind that the rubber band was 1845. That long ago. So we're like, okay, where's the bungee cord come in, right? All right. Well, this is where I think the first time I actually saw where they actually decided how to try to make bungee cords. In 1936, there were some English glider pilots that used gigantic elastic cords to launch their planes off hillsides. 
According to some scholars, the pilots inexplicably coined the word bungee as a name for their cords. Uh, sometime later, in 1941, uh, a Swede, Bjorn Goran Eriksson, <coughs> takes the glider catapult concept and shrinks the cords for everyday use. He braids together multiple strands of rubber and adds hooks to either end, giving birth to the modern Bjorn G cord. So I guess if you're in Sweden, that's how you say it. All right, so as we look at the bungee cord, there's, a, there's four life lessons I want us to talk about today. All right, just four. Zane, make sure I said four. He said, make sure I get to my conclusion and let you know the conclusion. So, so we're going to look at lesson number one, okay? The purpose. The purpose of the bungee cord, okay? You know, when you look at bungee cords, they come in all shapes and sizes and colors, okay? One thing I've often wondered, you know, when you go into, like, a hardware store, Home Depot, Lowe's, or even Walmart, wherever, and you see bungee cords, there's different sizes and different shapes, but does it really matter what color they are? Well, it does for me because I wanted pretty ones, and it's not just the black ones, right? But uh, apparently they come in all shapes and sizes. And so, so I started thinking about that, you know? All shapes and sizes and styles, just like us. Okay? And just as budget cords have specific purposes, some are long, some are short, some are a little thicker, some are skinnier. Okay? God designed all of us for a specific purpose. We don't all have the same purpose, but we all have a specific purpose to use. Okay? In Colossians 1.16, it says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, as you think about what's going on in today's world, okay, what would the world be like if we all accepted or we all agreed that we all had differences but we all had one purpose in Christ and we all needed to work together? Would the world look any different? Stace and I were at uh, Walmart, or as Chris likes to say, the Walmart, um, uh, the other day. And, you know, obviously they've got their wear your mask policy all the time, and people come in there. But it just seemed for us that day that, that just the, uh, I'm not going to say disregard for other humans around you uh, was just rampant. Uh, I would say easily in that 15 minutes that we were in there, multiple people in a hurry, multiple people that, Push their cards with somebody that's not paying attention, kind of goes out there and they look at them and say a few words. Whatever else, or Walmart workers that just like get on my way, I've got my stuff to do. Um, and then people butting in front of you in line. That didn't happen to Stacy, it did. Um, and, then, and then us being quick to judge those people, you know, on that too. But at the same time, last time I checked, God designed and breathed life in every one of us. And last time I checked, Jesus died for every one of us. Me. And we all have a purpose. So bungee cords have specific applications, just like us. Okay? Just like he's called some of us to maybe preach, some of us to be a teacher, some of us to evangelize, some of us to use a certain talent that we have. But he's all given us different talents, but it all came from the same God. He's given us all abilities, but it came from the same God. Ephesians 2, 8, 10 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you are like me, um, oftentimes I, I start out thinking I know what my purpose is. It could be maybe on a a project, or it could just be for that day. And oftentimes when I get in the middle of the day, things come up that distract me from that purpose. And before I know it, I feel like I'm kind of just going around in circles, going around in circles, and not really and ending the day saying, what, what, what did I accomplish? What did I do? And sometimes I feel like that's kind of where my life is sometimes. You know, we wander around and wander around. Purpose number three. Bungee cords work best when used as designed. Again, God created us to, for a specific purpose, a specific design. 
And whenever we're within that purpose, that design, things go well. But as most people do, there comes a time when we believe that we know better than God does. We believe that we can do it this way better than he can do it this way. Or we let things distract us and we lose sight of what our purpose is. In Proverbs 19.21 it says, Many are the plans in a person's hearts, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. That prevails. Going back to the idea of the bungee cord. Okay? And anybody can answer this, but I've got to fill you guys. So how many of you guys own one bungee cord? Well, let me tell you that. How many guys go to the store and you're looking for bungee cords, you buy one bungee cord? Why not? You buy two? Or you need more than one, right? Or you're like, ooh, here's a pack of ten, and they've got different colors, different sizes. I'm going to get those, right? Okay. And so when you use those together for a purpose, you can often secure nice things with them, right? Has anybody ever gone down the highway and you got behind a vehicle and they had a load of stuff and they had secured with bungee, bungee straps and you're like, hmm, I think I'm going to get on the other lane. <laughs> I hope that holds, right? Okay. Or I saw a picture as I was looking up for the history of bungee straps. I saw a guy weed eating, a picture of a guy weed eating, and he had two bungee cords for suspenders. <laughs> you know, hey, you know, it works, right? Okay. And then I also saw a picture, drive, and again, this is... Nathan will get a kick out of this for driving a school bus. Picture of a school bus driver in, I'm assuming it was probably way down south, but it looked like a school bus to me, and the seatbelt wouldn't quite reach all the way around, so he had a bungee strap hooked to the seatbelt on down to the seat frame. I'm sure that'll work real well, <laughs> real well, okay? But oftentimes we think we can handle it, we can do it our way, without really staying back, looking back and saying, what's the purpose? How can I, how can I use these as intended? Because right? we never use things as they were not intended to be used, right? Right? By the way, next time you buy a bungee cord, have you, do, you, do you realize that every one of them comes with a little piece of paper on them, pretty much? Or if they're in a small package, there's a label on the back. You know what that label's for? Disclaimer? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it pretty much says, use, use eye protection when using this product. No, I never do that. It says, do not overstretch. Make sure that it's securely fastened. You know, hold away from the face, all that good stuff. Because we never let those things snap us back, right? And by the way, you know, you know why they started using plastic hooks instead of metal ones? That's exactly right. And they cause less injury. Less injury, right? All right. So lesson number two. Life lesson number two. The stretch, okay? So if we're talking about overstretching or using these things, okay? You know, We've got different sizes of bungee cords for different applications. But bungee cords perform best when they're stretched a bit, just like us, okay? If you take a bungee cord that is, say, four feet long, but you only need it, need it to go about two feet, how productive is that? You go around a couple times, right? The more the better, right? Okay? And heaven forbid, nobody's ever put a knot in their bungee cord to make it shorter, have they? Oh, yeah, yeah. And by the way, there's actually adjustable ones now that have like a sliding knot. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but they actually do, so. But just like a bungee cord needs to be stretched a little bit in order for it to be productive, we need to be stretched a little bit to be productive. Okay. God didn't intend us for us just to be comfortable all the time, to just sit there. He expected us, he wanted us to be able to be stretched a little bit here and there, to step out of our comfort zone. To be, because we perform better when we do that. Okay? In Philippians 3, 13 through 14, it says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I saw a picture I think uh, Chris posted, or the Knope phone posted. Alex Knoop has been jogging, running, uh, Stacy works at the high school, and so she's noticed him running back and forth. And and uh, it's been it's been several months ago, but she's like, man, she goes, she goes, I I thought I thought I was up there walking, and I thought that was Alex Canote that I passed, but it didn't look like Alex Canote. 
And then we got looking, and so anyway, but yeah, he had lost a lot of weight. And so yesterday, I guess he participated in a individual half marathon, I guess because of social distancing, whatever it was. Virtual. Virtual. So how does that work? You hold your phone up in front of I don't know how that works, you know. Katie's done that too, I think. All right. But anyway, so here's the deal. You know, just like me, if I said, hey, I'm going to do that, and I get up on Dennis, I'm going to go run this half marathon, well, you might as well just call the ambulance because you'll find me about a half mile down the road, you know. <laughs> that way, maybe not a half mile, I might make it a mile, okay. But, uh, but anyway, just like Alex, and I'm sure Katie else, is that when they decided that, hey, this is one of my, what my goal was going to be, they had to start stretching towards that goal, okay. Little bit by little bit by little bit, okay. And I would, I would assume that if you ask any runner, you know, running that 13.1 marathon, was it mile marathon, was it hard? And they say, yeah, it took a lot of effort. Was it, was it as hard as the very first mile you decided to run? And my, answer, my guess would be probably not because that stretch was there little by little by little, okay? And just like most people, when you go exercise or if you're like me, you don't really exercise and then you go play volleyball or something, you fill it for the next two years and you know, no, because you know, because there's a joke in my family, and George especially likes to say it, because we'll go out with volleyball, and I'm, you know, my shoulders got a bad shoulder, and my arm, so I'm stretching and whatever. He's like, make sure we tell Jeff two hours before we're going to play, so he can be ready to play. <laughs> but you know, we have to get warmed up. Okay, we have to get warmed up. And so God calls that stretching growth. So in Second Peter three eighteen, it says, "But growth in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ." To him be glory both now and forever, and amen. Okay? We aren't going to have the opportunity to grow in our relationship with God, with Jesus, with each other, with our church, with our, with our neighbors, unless we are allowed to stretch a little bit. To stretch out a little bit here, stretch out a little bit there. Okay? If we stay all nice in our little package or all just con contracted up, we probably won't be very, very useful at all. Useful all. A bungee cord that is overstretched will fail, just like us. And again, I think earlier we asked, have you ever tried to stretch a bungee cord probably further than it should go? Well, do you know that on, the pa on most packages, and I read this the other day, because I, I looked at several packages, and even on the little ones that you have in front of you, it says it right on those. Do you know what it says the maximum stretch limit is on them? There's actually a stretch limit. And, and it's not until it stops. That's not what it is. <laughs> you know what it is? What? Nope. Well, it could be. I don't know. 50%. 50% of the stretch is what is what the recommended one. So we're like, wait a minute. You're supposed to stretch those babies out to where they almost can't go anymore, right? Okay. But that's what it says. If you don't believe me, read the label on them. It's, so after you get done reading the label, you're like, what use is this thing going to be for, right? But anyway, but if you overstretch a bungee cord through experience, you know a couple things are going to happen. Either one, it is going to hold, but over time, what's going to happen to it? What? What? It'll break down. Okay. Hunter, this is what happens when you try to use a bungee cord Hook him, hook him to a water tube. <laughs> so, thought that'd be a good idea. Well, it didn't work so good. All right. But if you notice this, this is one of those flat ones, but if you notice it's got a spot right here at the end that's pretty thin, it's almost ready to break, and down here you see it's how it's all narrow. There's not much stretch there, not like here. Okay. So obviously over time I have overstretched this thing way too much, way too much. And I would say that if I could keep, keep using this bungee cord, it's going to let me know real quick, you've overstretched me. So I try not to use that one very much. I still hold on, yeah, I do. I do. Can we edit that out of that? Okay. But if we overstretch something, we're going to fail, okay? And so oftentimes when God is prompting us, or calling us or pushing us to stretch a little bit. You know, whenever you're in a situation, wherever you're at, maybe you're in town and you see someone or something going on, and you're like, man, man I, feel like I, I feel like I should do something. I feel like I should say something. I feel like, I feel like I should go up to them. OK? 
Okay? You know, that's God trying to stretch us a little bit. Okay? But sometimes we decide that we want to stretch ourselves. Sometimes through selfish ambition, us being out of the purpose of God, God's word, we chase these things. We get distracted and we start stretching ourselves and stretching ourselves and stretching ourselves. Okay? You know, you probably have heard the saying, we're busy about keeping busy. Okay? And you probably heard people say that we don't really have any margin in our life anymore. Margins of time, margins of finance, because we've got ourselves stretched so thin. Okay. Now, if you work with bungee cords frequently, you know that when you get it stretched too thin, you know, okay, I'm going to stand back because it's, it's going to go. Right? It's pretty easy to tell, right? But how come it's so hard for us to see when we're running around and we're being stretched this way and this way? How, how come it's so hard for us to tell that we're being stretched thin and we're going to pop, and we're going to snap? But we just keep on trekking. Oftentimes, that's when God goes... And something happens, and then we go, whoa, God, why'd you let that happen for? And he's like, if I didn't, if I didn't stop the self-train, bad things were going to happen. And 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does, not, whoever does the will of God lives forever. All right, and this is something my wife, again, she says, I still keep things, and this is an example right here, my box. But let's just read the tangle, okay? I asked earlier how many people buy one bungee cord. My guess is you probably have multiple bungee cords lying in the house, okay? And if you Google life hacks for bungee cords, there's all kinds of, interesting little things you can do with bungee cords, all right? But uh, a lot of times there's things about how to organize your bungee cords, okay? Well, my wife will tell you I have a tendency to take all my bungee cords. I've got a bag in my truck that I have my tie-down straps, my bungee cords, but they're all put in there together. They're all put in there together. What are you shaking your head for? Okay? I don't know, shaking his head. Do you have a picture of it? What? Well, this is some of them, the ones I can get out of the bag. <laughs> but bungee cords thrown hastily together become a tangled mess, just like us. Okay? So again, you know, bungee cords have a specific purpose. Okay? They've got all these nice little hooks on the end of them that work great, right? And by the way, have you ever noticed if you've got a bungee cord and you're trying to get it out of a box or get it untangled, that those hooks hook on everything? But if, but like if you drop your keys or something in somewhere and you're like, hey, I've got this bunch of it, I might be able to get them. It's like the hook doesn't work anymore. <laughs> you ever notice that? What does it mean? Well, anyway, so these are some of the bungee cords I got this morning. I'll try to get one of them out of here. Uh, uh, well, anyway, you get the point, right? It becomes a tangled mess, right? And so again. If you look up life hacks for bungee cords, you'll see that there's all kinds of cool ways to organize them, right? I've seen this thing with PVC pipe cutting links, and you just hook them around the sides. I've seen pool noodles. I've seen all kinds of things. And I'm sure Brandon's got some great ideas on how to do that, because I'm sure he never has anything that looks like this. Yeah, all right. And by the way, if you want to try this, I recommend throwing in some toe straps and some tie-down straps with these. It works even better. It works even better. And my wife will tell you that I end up taking everything out of the bag to get my one bungee strap, and then I put everything back. Nice and neat, but I still put it all back in the same container so it still doesn't work out really big. It's time. But anyway, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Whenever we start letting our own self-ambitions get in the way of our purpose, and we start stretching ourselves as only God directing us and stretching us, sin starts to creep up on us. We start walking that line closer and closer to where God says, hey, you're getting close to that, and you need to stay away from that. There's a reason why in the Bible it says, flee from temptation. 
Oftentimes we see it and we're like, hey, I'm good, but we decide we want to walk right next to it. This is a flame coming, running coming. Oftentimes, if we stay too close to that sin, or we believe that we've got it and we don't give it to God, we get snared, we get tangled up, we get snared up. Just like these bungee cords in this box. In Ephesians 5, 15 through 16, it says, Be very careful then how you will live. Not as wise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So as you think about the life lesson of the tangle, think about your life. Think about are you doing things in your life that are allowing you to get tangled up? Or are you living as wise, making the most of every opportunity? My wife would tell you that I've done this a hundred, probably a thousand times, but yet I still don't take time to organize these or separate them out. Lesson number four, and this is our, our last lesson, the bungee jump, okay? And I'm just curious, has anybody ever gone bungee jumping in here? No, okay. All right, I'm sure we've, we've probably have all seen it, videos of it, and we're like, mm, I don't know about that, right? Okay, although I do have to admit that when my, I'm not gonna tell you which one, but when one of my kids was really young, one of them liked to bounce a lot, and I actually thought, wondered what would happen if I took a bunch of these and put them together and like, you know, never mind. <laughs> We're gonna go there. Okay. Just in case, yeah. Just in case. Just in case. All right. But anyway, so bungee jumping, all right? So has anybody ever thought about bungee going bungee jumping? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dad's like, no way. The tree's like, yeah. He would do it. He would do it. All right. I don't know. I'm not so. I don't so. No, I don't know about that. I don't like heights that much anyway. You know, I'm the kind of guy that, you know, you go to the lake and there's this little jump off in the water like a cliff. You know, even though I've done it, I'm the guy that kind of walks up the cliff and then I'm like, and I, I, I crouch down as I come off, thinking it's going to make it better, you know, <laughs> softer. You know. And it's funny how that works. You know, when my kids when they were younger, we'd go to Branson on Terrebonne Lake and there's this these cliffs that kind of were tiered, and you could do a small one, kind of medium one, a higher one. And they were younger, you'd be like, woo. No big deal. You know, the last time we went down there, guess what they wanted to do? Yeah, I'll pass on that. Pass on that. There's something about it as you get older, you're like, I don't know if it's maybe the wise thing, you're like, hmm, this isn't for me, or fear sticks in. But anyway, so bungee jumping requires two things. The first is faith. The first is faith. Okay. I'm sure if you're like me, if we think about going bungee jumping, probably the one thing is we're going to say, well, why in the world would I spend money to do that? Or more importantly, it's like, well, wait a minute, I don't really trust that that device, that those people, that that artist, I don't really trust that that's going to, that's going to do what it's supposed to do, because it's, there's been people that got hurt on that before, I, I just don't know, I just don't know about that, okay? But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, this is what God tells us. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see, what we do not see. If we knew that when we jumped off with a bungee strap on our legs that we would be perfectly fine, would you do it? <laughs> Maybe. Some would like, yeah. Okay. But there's no way to know because you're always saying there's always that chance, right? There's always that chance because you can't see into the future. You can't see what might possibly happen. All right? So there's a degree of trust here. But here's the deal. That's often what God wants us to do. Faith in God and in the circumstances that he puts us in, it's just like bungee jumping. Okay? He's like, hey, I've got your heart set. You're good to go. Don't worry about it. You're good to go. But, but because we can't see what's going to happen, we're like, mm, I don't know, God. I don't know. But guess what? God can see what's going to happen. He can see what's going to happen. In Matthew 14, 31, it says, and again, this is referring to when Jesus was walking on water. And Peter's like, Jesus, if that's you, call, you know, call me to you. And so Peter takes off, right? And then he started looking around him, got distracted. And then he started to sink. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught Peter and said, You have little faith. 
Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Oftentimes we doubt because when things start going wrong or things happen that we don't understand, we feel like that God doesn't have it. We feel like God doesn't have control of it. We feel like God's going to let us slip. We're going to feel like God forgot to check the bungee cord. Or he gave us, he gave us the one that's been used 200 times instead of the first time. Okay. I don't know about you. I'd rather, I'd rather use the one that was used a couple times than the one that was brand new, just in case. All right. Okay. By the way, the, is anybody jumped out of an airplane and parachuted? Ken has? Was that hard to do the first time? Well, was... The second time was. <laughs> <laughs> So does that mean the first time it didn't open, or? Uh... It was pushed. Oh, he was pushed. Okay. Yeah. Had to push you out. Okay. But I've often wondered about that. You see those people, especially in the military, that just they go out, and you know the level of trust that that equipment, that that parachute, that ripcord, or whatever it is, is going to operate. It's going to operate. Okay. And I think most people now, when they jump, I think most time they have a backup chute. Is that right? Backup shoot most time. Okay. But you know, you're thinking about packing a parachute, the guy that packs the parachute, you know, in school, 99% on all your tests was a great thing. But who wants a guy that gets 99% of the parachutes right <laughs> packing the parachute? Right? I don't know. So bungee jumping requires two things. The first is faith. The second is a leap, action. Chris told a short little story. It's been it's been a month or two ago, certainly maybe several months. I don't know how long ago. About about I think it was three frogs on a log, and they were whatever was going on. They were sitting there, and one of them said to the other one, said or made the decision to jump into the water, and it said how many frogs were still on the log, and the answer was they all were because making a decision to is different than actually acting on the decision. That's kind of like faith is. And I, I, I think God's been working on me on that. It's having faith that God has this, has this, has this. And I think he keeps putting these little things to say, hey, just take a step. Just take a step. Just take a step. And I find myself doing this. I don't feel nothing. I don't feel nothing. In fact, uh, as I was looking up uh, some quotes for bungee jumping and faith, I came across one from Martin Luther King Jr., which... It's kind of fitting for today's times, but it says, he made a quote, and his quote was this, is faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. The whole staircase. And I said, how, much, how many times do we, or God is asking us to take that step, and we don't see the landing. We don't see where it's going to go. Okay? And that's where faith comes in. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And so here we are. If someone's asked the question, you know, do you have faith in God? I would be like, Yes. Show me. What would be what would be our answer for that part? Um, last Thursday, uh, Stacy and I were in Columbia, and uh, we were over by the Chick Fil A in Columbia there. And if you know Chick Fil A, is you, know, you still have to wait in the little drive through lines, and they've got this little intricate go this way and this way and all this stuff. So we're there waiting. Of course, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, only in America do you wait like 20 minutes for a chicken sandwich in the drive through you know, letting your car run, and you use more gas in your car than it costs for the chicken sandwich while you're sitting there. But anyway, anyway so we're there, we get our drive through stuff, and we're pulling out, and, we're, and we, we go back past the old Macy's. I don't know if you know that's at, okay? And as we're pulling by the old Macy's building, to turn on that road there, whatever road that is, there's a gas station there. There's a man walking. And just, you could just tell by his, 
his uh, way he was dressed, he was might have been homeless. I don't know for sure. Okay, but he uh, wasn't groomed very well, and looked like he was mumbling um, things. But what, what caught my eyes, you know, I saw him up a couple cars, saw him walking, and he wasn't paying a lick to, attention to any cars. He was just walking, uh, just a white t-shirt, holes in, uh, dirty sweatpants. Uh, and what caught my attention is he didn't have any shoes on. And then as I looked at him, I was like, hey, why doesn't he have any shoes on? Of course, I know he's outside. Hello, Jeff. Why do you think he doesn't have any shoes on? Then I realized that also he had socks on, but most of the socks were gone. There were just big old holes in the bottom. And he was just, and this, and this was on, what? Thursday? Yeah. You said Thursday. Oh, did I say Thursday? Sorry. Before it cooled down, so it's hot outside. What am I doing up here? No. So it was the day that I was warm. Wednesday? I don't know. Anyway, it was warm, and I'm like, man, he's walking across the pavement. Almost bare foot, and I'm like, of course, here I am thinking, hmm, I wonder how I'm up to Cedar Brook. And I was like, no. So, anyway, so I pointed out to Stacy, and we're kind of both looking there, and it's about time for us to turn to go on the road. And I'm like, walking, walk right across the intersection towards that gas station. And the whole time, I feel like, take a step, take a step. I look around, I turn left, and he goes right. And as we go on around the corner, Stacy goes, what are we doing? And I'm like, well, we're going to the library to pick up your books. And she goes, no. She goes, we're terrible Christians. And that hurt. Because, you know, in that moment, I think God was like this, that little bit of stretch. And I, and I was making up excuses. Well, what can I do? Maybe he's on drugs. Maybe he's high. I don't know. He's mumbling himself, you know? Maybe he's going to whoop me upside the head. I don't know. He's a big guy. He's a pretty good sized guy. And then I started thinking, well, you know what? We need to start making up bags of like socks and shoes and extra clothes. So that way we can just hand to people when we see that. Excuses. I could have taken him to the store. We could have bought that guy. So again, where was my faith then that God said, hey, I got this. I got this. So when I raise my hand and say, oh, yeah, I've got faith in God. I think he's saying, show me. Show me. So anyway, so now you get your bungee cord there. So those were our four lessons. So, so get him in the close up or wrap up here. So I'm saying, there you go. Wrap him up, closing up here. So if you look at your bungee cord, okay, there's a couple things I want you to notice as we close. Bungee cords work best when they're fastened or anchored at the ends, just like us. Think about how useful that bungee cord would be if there weren't any hooks on the end of it. What would you do with it? Well, you could play with it. If you're a young boy, you could find lots of things to do with it. You could snap people pretty good with that thing. All right? But if you look at those hooks, especially if you hold them up, after I get my mess up, right? if you hold it up like that, it looks like a J. So, as you take your little bungee cord home, I want you to think about that J. And that, that end of that bungee cord is anchored in Jesus. But that J stands for Jesus. And just like if you've ever tried to hook a bungee cord to something and it, you thought it was on there, but you went to pull it across and you maybe angled a little bit and it slipped off, it comes sailing back. It comes sailing back and whacks you in the hand, sometimes in the face. Right? But if you've got an anchor in Jesus, it's never going to slip off. It's never going to slip off. And if you take that hook and you switch it the other way, and that reminds me of a shepherd's hook. As a reminder that, you know what? God's got me. He's not going to let me slip away. He's not going to let it come unhooked. He's not going to let it break. He's got me. And for me, he's asking me, now that you know that I've got you, what are you going to use your hook for? Are you going to continue to look at opportunities and let them just go by, or are you going to set your hook out? And so no matter where we're at, we first have to decide whether we want to be anchored in Jesus or not. Because if we're wandering around, doing our own thing, we're just like this. A tangled mess. No real purpose. But if we let Jesus come into our lives, 
and let him be the anchor for us. He gives us purpose. And he allows us to be stretched. So as you know, um, uh, my, my brother, I call him my brother. I don't have any biological brothers, but I call him brother. Troy lost his wife, Carrie. And, you know, the questions of why, why did it happen? You know, and all the things that, that they've gone through and the experiences and the purpose and where the anchor's at. Where the anchor's at. I, I can't imagine what would have the feeling be if Troy and Carrie and the family didn't have an anchor in Jesus Christ. And I can't help but imagine that even though it's hard for us to understand why that Jesus is going, I got you. I got you. Don't worry about it. I got you. It's just hard for us because we can't see that next step. That next step. So, in closing, again, Zane, we're wrapping up. I promise we're done. Is that I'm going to leave you with uh, something I, I came across to you by a, a man that did a devotion. I read it and it just struck me because it happened a day after this ordeal on Wednesday or Thursday with this man that I pretty much just let go on. And it said this. The right time to do the right thing is right now. And so for me, that was God telling me, you know what? You made up all these plans to be ready to do the right thing the next time, which isn't necessarily bad. But God doesn't call us to do the right thing the next time. He calls us to do the right thing now. And whenever we don't, he doesn't kick us to the curb. He doesn't, like, cut the bungee cord in half and throw it in the trash can. He just hooks us back up and says, get up, let's go again. Let's go again. So anyway, so those are just some life lessons I've learned from bungee cords. And uh, I hope that you can take your little bungee cord home with you and use it, you know. Don't overstretch it, Brandon, you know. They're great, they're great for putting up, uh, tying up uh, extension cords or whatever else. So. But uh, use it, but if you want to just, you know, take it with you. I wouldn't recommend it as a bracelet because the hook's kind of hooked to you, but anyway. So, but wherever you're at, if you want to, uh, as we do our invitation here in a few minutes, uh, just spend some time thinking about how's God stretching you? What's your purpose in the Lord? Do you know what your purpose in the Lord is? If you don't, Maybe that's where you need to start, getting on your knees, asking God to help you find your purpose. Mm-hmm.